thank you for coming today. I'm Melissa Randazzo of Adelphi University, along with Scott Schrader of Hofstra, McClady Kajimasuma from SUNY Fredonia, Max Freeman of St. John's. We are here to welcome you to the New York Communication Sciences and Disorders Colloquium Series, installment number two. Our talk today is aphasia in multilingual contexts. Uh, we're going to get started in just a minute. I'll introduce our speakers. Before we do that, I just want to go over the format. Each speaker will have about 30 minutes to talk about their research, and then we'll have a five to 10 minute Q&A period, and then we'll transition to the second speaker, 30 minutes, five to 10 minute Q&A period. And then if there's remaining questions or overarching discussion, we can do that for an extra 15 to 20 minutes following both talks. We encourage you to use the chat. We do have um, some members of the series committee monitoring the chat. So if you have questions that occur to you during the talk, you can pop them in there and then we can read them out during the Q&A period. And you're also welcome to raise your hand using the raise hand function uh, um, to ask questions during the Q&A. Without further ado, I think I will go ahead and get started. Our first speaker today is uh, Dr. Aviva Lerman, who recently completed her PhD under the direction of Dr. Lorraine Obler at the CUNY Graduate Center. Dr. Lerman is a speech and language pathologist who teaches in the Communication Disorders Program at Hadassah Academic College in Jerusalem. She's been working in adult rehabilitation for over 15 years in acute, subacute, and chronic stages patients um, at Hadassah Hospital at in private practice. Her research interests include brain and language, aphasia, dementia, and healthy aging in bilingual and multilingual populations. Dr. Lerman, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you today about multilingualism and aphasia, a topic that is very close to my heart. Um, so let's uh, start by talking about multilingualism. What do we mean when we say that somebody is multilingual? A multilingual is a person who uses more than one language regularly. And here the focus is on use uh, in different contexts, but always um, Now, multilingual is, it has a continuum of language abilities. So multilingualism um, includes those with differences in proficiency across languages. So those who have two languages that are of similar proficiency or one language that is more proficient than another or multiple languages, each at a different proficiency. The relative proficiencies are not necessarily stable across the lifespan. So whilst acquiring a new language, that proficiency is gonna increase, but also changes in language environment or uh, different uses of language, whether somebody marries someone with a different language or works in an environment in a different language. So the, the relative proficiencies change across the lifespan. And we also need to address the difference between a multilingual and a multidialectal person. So uh, very obviously multilingual, if If we have two completely separate, they're very different languages, so I would be considered bilingual in those two languages. But then what about uh, my English dialects? Uh, as you can probably hear, I'm a British English speaker, a native British English speaker, but I spent three years in New York, so perhaps I'm multi-dialectal between British English and American English, but I think most people would probably agree that they're not really completely separate dialects, that there's just too much overlap. But then there are other languages which do have very distinct dialects. So for example, uh, an Arabic speaker who is literate has already got at least two dialects. So the spoken Arabic dialect and the written Arabic dialect, which are two separate dialects. And then there's the in-between pairs. So uh, my colleague, Taryn Malcolm is gonna talk uh, after me about um, a language pair that's sort of somewhere in the middle. So Jamaican Creole and English, where Jamaican Creole is actually based on English later. So we have this continuum of languages between multi-dialectalism and all the way through to multilingualism. 
And there's also a continuum of how much interaction there is between the languages. When we think of a bilingual, we don't think of two monolinguals. We know that there's interaction between the languages, but how much interaction there is, is going to depend first on the languages themselves. So um, which language families they're from, how much overlap there is between those languages. So for example, uh, borrowed words or cognates. So in English, we have the word television, and in Hebrew, we have the word televisia. So they belong to a group of cognates where there's really large overlap between both meaning and phonology. And how much overlap, how many borrowed words is based on the language families and also uh, some historical uh, issues in there. Or grammatical rules, how much overlap there is in the, in the grammar, in the syntax, the morphosyntax. syntax. But there are also um, lexing. So how much of one language is acceptable to be mixed into the other language is very much community-based, depending on which languages and where you live and the community you live in, how much language mixing is appropriate and acceptable is very much uh, an issue. And still we're talking about healthy multilingual people. So we end up with this very heterogeneous population with diverse combinations of languages acquired at varying ages uh, with differing degrees of proficiency and different use patterns across the lifespan. So that's in healthy multilingual people. Let's think now about aphasia. So just so that everyone uh, is on the same page, when we're talking about aphasia, we're talking about an acquired language disorder resulting from in, in injury to the brain and it's most typically, typically the left hemisphere. So if we take a look at this left hemisphere over here, perisylvian areas. So all these areas surrounding that sylvian fissure. So for example, we have this area formerly known as Broca's area, including the class uh, opercularis, plaster angularis, very much focused on language production. And we have the temporal lobe, the superior and middle temporal lobe, but specifically uh, very much uh, related to um, language comprehension and that posterior part, the area formerly known as Wernicke's area. So these peris uh, perisylvian areas when damaged, uh, usually result in aphasia. And we compare that language impairment to non-linguistic cognitive uh, impairment. So if somebody has aphasia, it means that their language impairment uh, and their language is more impaired than their non-linguistic cognitive uh, skills. We assess a person with aphasia by looking at the skills that are spared, the skills that are impaired, And then how and we can go down the restorative route. So are we going to improve or restore uh, impaired function? Uh, so that, for example, uh, very, very common in the acute, subacute stages. Or compensatory, we're going to compensate for, def for deficits. Um, and then together, how that fits with community support and integration of the person with aphasia. Okay, so what about aphasia in someone who is multilingual? How do we have to approach them? How do we think about them differently than just uh, a monolingual with aphasia. So aphasia in a multilingual is the loss or impairment of all their languages to varying degrees after damage to the language dominant brain hemisphere, so that left hemisphere, uh, perisylvian era predominantly, uh, and the language impairment of each language will depend on language background and also on place of lesion. So Paradis is uh, spoke, uh, Uh, written about uh, parallel would be where uh, two or more languages are impaired uh, to the same extent relative to the pre-stroke language abilities, whereas a differential impairment would be that differential uh, deficits in each language relative to the pre-stroke uh, language skills. So when we think about uh, the place of lesion in a, some uh, multilingual person, we're still talking about the, uh, the language network, this perisylvian area, but we also have another network which is closely connected to it, which uh, Abutalevi and Green in 2007 described as a language control network. So a network that is involved in controlling the selection of which language in a, to, to use in a multilingual, uh, the, the switching from one language to another, uh, and really being in control of those languages when it's appropriate to use which language uh, and then use using it appropriately, prefrontal cortex, inferior parietal lobe, 
and the medial anterior cingulate cortex, and also the basal ganglia that the subcortical structures. So if we just think of that in terms of the, uh, how that relates to the language uh, control network, so again, this prefrontal, uh, inferior parietal, and then, and then more medially, okay, there's uh, ACC and the basal ganglia sort of more in the middle there. And so we can see that they're very closely related, both in terms of uh, function, but also in terms of place in the brain, and they really, they work in tandem with each other. So each multilingual, each multilingual individual with aphasia is likely to show a unique pattern of language loss. So that heterogeneous group in um, healthy uh, multilingual people translates to a, a very, um, a very unique pattern across people, uh, multilingual people with aphasia. And so when we assess these patients, we mean the multilingualism effects of their language skills and the stroke effects of their language skills. And so we're going to do our language assessment like we would do with anyone with aphasia. And we're looking at impaired versus spared language skills, uh, any cross-linguistic influence that perhaps was there before the stroke or um, as some kind of compensation, and also the translation skills, which is often a skill that can be uh, utilized uh, to their advantage uh, in treatment. But we have to take into account their language background, their history, which languages, when were they acquired, and how were they used. And then also thinking about that brain injury. Is the injury in the language network, or does it also include some areas of that language control network? I just want to give you an example of the Western aphasia battery. I'm not sure uh, how many of you use this, but the Western aphasia battery um, uh, is an excellent assessment. And we have um, we have a translation aphasia quotient. So you have the subtests, which includes spontaneous speech, uh, which includes content and fluency, auditory comprehension, repetition, and naming and word finding. And altogether, the participant will get a score of, out of 100. And the lower the score, the more severe their aphasia, or at least that's true in monolinguals. But what about in multilinguals? Does the aphasia quotient only reflect the aphasia severity, so the impairment from the stroke, or is there something else involved in terms of their languages? I had a participant who I tested on the web, and I'm going to show you a short video of his picture description in English. His aphasia quotient in English was 87.5. So he only had a mild aphasia in English and he was diagnosed with uh, anomic aphasia. Well, you can see that he's much worse in Hebrew than in English. He's really struggling to say anything at all. And any sentences he says are very, very short two word sentences. Um, and when we looked at his, his aphasia quotient, he's diagnosed with a moderate severe non-fluent aphasia. Huge difference between that mild anomic aphasia, 87.5, and the moderate severe non-fluent uh, aphasia of 50.1. And so we need to ask ourselves, okay, is his impairment in English and, and in Hebrew just because of the stroke? We need a bit more background information on this participant to be able to answer the question. So what were his language skills before the stroke? So his English was his first language, first acquired language, and his most dominant language throughout uh, his life. And he acquired Hebrew uh, from elementary school and upwards, and he um, improved in his Hebrew skills. He actually married a Hebrew speaker uh, and they were married for 10 years. Um, but he only really reached uh, a moderate proficiency in Hebrew at its peak, okay? And it's been, and this uh, film was taken 14 years since his stroke and he hasn't used Hebrew almost all during those 14 years. Does the Hebrew reflect only his language impairment from the brain injury? We're pretty certain that it doesn't, okay? He only had that moderate proficiency beforehand and it probably underwent attrition uh, over the years since his stroke. So we have to be really careful when we say, oh, this person has a moderate, severe, non-fluent aphasia. What does that really mean in a multilingual person with aphasia? Let's turn now to uh, language recovery. Um, when we think of language recovery, we think of either spontaneous recovery, which is usually in the acute or the subacute stages. And we also think about, as speech and language pathologists, we think about recovery uh, as a response to treatment. And so whilst we, we, we give treatment, we provide treatment of 
but in the acute and the subacute stages, in terms of research, it's very difficult to separate those spontaneous effects treatment at uh, of aphasia. And then when we look at treatment effects, we can be pretty um, certain that there's, there's no or there's minimal spontaneous recovery as well. And so a little bit later on in this talk, I'm going to um, um, present to you the team model, the treatment effects in aphasia in multilingual people model, um, which um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Goral and I uh, recently published about. And it's really looking at um, what uh, are we seeing when we uh, look at the treatment effects in people with aphasia? What's going on? What do we have to take into account? And when we talk about treatment effects, we can measure those effects in different ways. So we can look at the direct treatment effects. So I looked at this stimuli in this context, in this language during treatment, did it improve or not? And we can measure that. But the gold standard in treatment are generalization to other contexts, and in this case, also to other languages. So we look at within language generalization, similar to monolinguals if the, um, with the generalization out of treatment, and that's going to depend on aphasia severity and type of treatment. And we have a, a lot of information about that from the monolingual literature. And then we look, can look at cross-language generalization. If I treat the participant in language A, are we going to see generalization effects to language B? And this, of course, is unique to multilinguals. And the literature uh, shows us very mixed results in terms of cross-language generalization. There are some studies that have found no cross-language generalization uh, across participants. There are, some study, there are some studies that have found that there are some cross-language generalization, and of those, some of that cross-language generalization is weak and some is stronger. There are those who found uh, cross-language generalization in only one direction, so from language A to B, but not vice versa. And then there are others that are found in both directions. So really, we need to ask ourselves, what is wrong? How can we understand on and in different directions? And so this is where I want to introduce you to the team model, okay? Where we look at which factors are affecting whether within and cross-language generalization will occur. Now the model focuses on cross-language generalization, but I'm gonna bring in within language generalization as well within the same context here. And so the model looks at multilingualism related variables, stroke related variables, and treatment related variables, which we really talked about already during this talk. The first step of this model are the variables. So we have those multilingualism related variables. We have age of acquisition and that affects the language use and exposure across the lifespan, but not only. There are other factors that are of one language relative to the others. Our stroke related variables, of course, the brain lesion site, where is the lesion? Is it affecting the language network or is it also affecting the language control network? And as we said, they work in tandem with each other and they're very close uh, in terms of position in the brain. Uh, and then that time post onset, how long since the stroke are we seeing this patient, this participant? And how is that going to affect um, um, the damage done by the stroke, because we know that very often immediately after a stroke, there's a lot of damage, but then a lot of swelling and that swelling goes down. And then we see uh, that actually that's a spontaneous recovery that the, the language skills are actually not as bad as, as we first thought. So it's important to know that time post onset since the stroke. And then both each language impaired relative to the other languages. And it's actually a dynamic, um, it's a dynamic relativ relativity between those languages because, for example, uh, as time goes on since after the stroke, uh, the difference between each language can change based on language use and exposure. So these arrows here, right, this shows that uh, dynamic effect. So if, for example, somebody used one language at work, but they didn't go back to work after their stroke, so that's going to affect as the, as the years go on and that language is used less and less, if at all, then we're expecting that language to undergo attrition. And also from the stroke itself, if one language is better spared than another language, 
then we expect the better spared language to be used more because there's already difficulty in communication anyway. And so then there can be uh, an even bigger difference between those languages. And so when we have these, I mean, thinking, so what are we going to focus our treatment on? What are we looking at? And we think about the linguistic distance between languages. Is there something between those languages that is shared that I can treat? And then I have more chance of improving that in both languages. Um, but also, uh, which language am I going to treat? And that's a big question in the literature. Do I treat the first acquired language, the better spared language, the, the weaker language? How do I decide which language? Or maybe I treat both of them together. This is still a big question in the literature. And so Kiran and her colleagues um, talk about mechanisms that underlie uh, treatment effects that they saw in their, uh, in their participants. Um, and this is the second level of the T model, okay? So Kiran and her colleagues discuss uh, spread activation throughout the, the language system, but this can also um, increase interference. So within language interference of, for example, semantically uh, related uh, lexical items, or even, um, um, specific grammatical, um, similar grammatical processes or other language processes, but also cross language where we have, uh, we can increase the interference of the other language, especially with translation equivalence. And then we need these inhibition mechanisms that are controlling that interference. And when you have, and, and, and she hypothesized that you have a balance between activation mechanisms and inhibition mechanisms. Okay. And so, uh, uh, the hypothesis is that when activation is stronger than inhibition, then we're going to see um, positive generalization. But when inhibition is stronger than inhibition, we're going to see that generalization across language. But I like that one step further. Um, and so we have this um, uh, idea of stronger activation mechanisms with uh, weaker inhibition mechanisms, so that spreading activation in the uh, untreated language is gonna result in positive cross-language treatment effects. And when they're equal, there's null effects. But we also um, looked at when you treat one language, the other language needs to be strongly inhibited. That inhibition can then linger. And then when you test the, uh, the other language, if it's still being uh, strongly inhibited, you may even see negative cross-language treatment effects. So it almost seems like the languages have got worse because it's just being still being strongly inhibited immediately after that treatment block. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a connected and have effect one on the other and also how they affect that spreading activation and increasing in interference uh, within those mechanisms. And also the brain lesion site is gonna uh, also affect which mechanisms are more damaged and working properly, not working properly. And then how those mechanisms underlie the treatment effects that we're seeing. So just to understand this model a little better, I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, two of my doctoral uh, participants and talk you through uh, the model based on their um, language, uh, language um, history, their brain lesion, and the treatment that we provided. So these two participants, we call them EHO3 and EHO4, they have very similar language backgrounds, both uh, speak English and Hebrew, and they have very similar left MCA lesion, and they also that we observed. Let's start with them uh, had a large MCA stroke, uh, which affected their language network, and certainly in one of them, the language control network, and we really inferred from the medical notes that in both of them, the language network and the control network was impaired. Their English was their uh, native language uh, acquired at birth, the age of acquisition was, was birth, constant use and exposure of English even after moving to Israel as adults, and so they had very high pre-stroke language abilities in English, both of them. Okay, and then together with the stroke, 
they had uh, relatively to their, their Hebrew, they had very strong post-drug language abilities in English, okay? Uh, they were impaired, they had aphasia, but if they were, their English abilities were stronger than their Hebrew. Their Hebrew age of acquisition was the elementary school it was between five and seven years they started to acquire Hebrew. And their um, proficiency improved uh, over their elementary school years and high school years, but the constant use and exposure of Hebrew uh, only happened after they both moved to Israel as adults, so one age 26 and one age 19. They had uh, high pre-stroke language abilities in Hebrew. They spent uh, over 30 years speaking fluent Hebrew uh, before their stroke. And then with the stroke, they had weaker post-stroke language abilities relative to their English. And we also think about that dynamic relationship between uh, the multilingualism variables and the stroke. So if we think about time post-onset, they were, we tested both of them about five, six years after their stroke. And so they had five or six years of the stronger post-stroke language abilities in English. And so that it's very likely that they then had exposure and use of English and their language history confirmed this. And they were diagnosed with moderate non-fluent aphasia um, at the time of our testing. Whereas in Hebrew, um, because uh, Hebrew was weaker post-stroke, they then had less language exposure and use of Hebrew since the stroke uh, and were um, diagnosed with severe non-fluent aphasia. So that difference between the languages may have actually got bigger during those five to six years. And so we know there are post-stroke language abilities at the time of uh, our study. And so we looked at what treatment we were going to provide for them. And we focused our treatment on um, the semantic network. So we did verb network strengthening treatment, which is called VNEST for short. And it focuses on the uh, semantic network, which is um, considered to be shared across languages in multilingual. We also, it, when we think about English and Hebrew, we think about languages that are very, very different. But we provided treatment uh, using basic SVO structure that are very, very similar uh, in English and Hebrew. The basic sentence structure is subject, verb, object in both languages. And we only used verbs that shared argument structure across languages. So we were able to focus our treatment on a lot of shared um, um, processes uh, and levels uh, across the languages. We provided one treatment block in English and one treatment block in Hebrew. One participant had first in Hebrew and one participant had first in English. Just uh, take a quick look at the within language generalization. So we hypothesized, we hypothesized that uh, in English, okay, so we provided treatment in English that there would be um, strong activation of the semantic system and the uh, lexical semantic interface in English, talking about that strong language, better spent. We expected there to be such generalization for words and for sentences in both the participants and for narrative production in the EHO4. So that within language generalization was strong across the two of them. In Hebrew, we hypothesized that the activation of the semantic system and the lexical semantic in interface wouldn't be as strong as English because that Hebrew was a weaker post-stroke. Again, some interference of semantically similar items. And so what we hypothesized and saw was that within language generalization would be less robust in Hebrew than in English. And indeed in EHO3, we saw uh, within language generalization only in object naming. And for uh, EHO4, we saw that, um, sorry, we saw that only at the sentence level, okay? So now a quick look at the cross-language generalization before I finish. Um, so when we think about cross-language generalization in English, we're talking about the participants receiving a treatment block in Hebrew and then looking at those English language skills immediately afterwards compared to before the Hebrew treatment. So we hypothesized that the activation of the semantic system and the lexical uh, semantic interface in Hebrew wouldn't be as strong as English, uh, but that there would be a strong interference of the lexical semantic interface in English, right? Because we, we, have, to, um, we have to robustly control that interference uh, in English in order for treatment to be effective in Hebrew. 
Um, and so we have that really strong uh, inter, um, control of interference um, in English during the, the Hebrew treatment. And so if those inhibition mechanisms that controlling interference are strong and they linger after treatment is relatively strong, but that lingering inhibition is just as strong. So then we're going to have no cross-language germinization. And this is what we observed in EHF4. There was minimal change for words, sentences, and narratives in English after treatment in Hebrew. Or we're going to have the spreading activation of a moderately strengthened semantic system that's relatively strong, but that lingering inhibition, uh, those lingering inhibition mechanisms are, are stronger, much stronger, that immediately after the treatment block in Hebrew, we're going to see negative cross-language uh, generalization in, uh, in English. So, and this is what we observed in EHO3. So we saw a decline for words, sentences, and narratives in his English immediately after the Hebrew treatment block. So then conversely, when we provided the treatment in English, what happened to their language? It's only a weaker interference of the lexical semantic interface in Hebrew. It's a weaker language. There's less interference of that language during English treatment. So then that requires um, that the control of that interference doesn't need to be, a, uh, be strong in order for treatment in English to be effective. And so we hypothesized that we would be spreading activation of a strengthened semantic system, which is strong because the treatment uh, is in English, that stronger language, um, and that that would be stronger than those inhibition mechanisms because uh, the interference was weaker and wouldn't need to be controlled quite as much. And so we were expecting to see positive cross-language treatment effects, which is what we saw for both of the participants. In uh, EHO3, we uh, observed improvement for verbs in both single words and sentences. And for EHO4, we observed um, and how they affect the, these mechanisms underlying treatment effects that we um, expect to see or that we've seen, and we're trying to explain why we've seen them. Just to summarize, OK? Um, this talk was about understanding the factors that contribute to treatment effects in multilingual people with aphasia. And we're beginning to understand why each case study results in different treatment effects. Now, we still have a long way to go to fully understand the mechanisms involved and the contribution of these factors that affect mechanisms. We're still at the hypothesis stage. We think this is happening. It hasn't been tested empirically yet, either behaviorally or with brain imaging. But we can use the T model as a new way to think about the integration of factors, how complex this actually is, um, and then and the underlying mechanisms of these treatment effects. But also, we can use the T model perhaps as a basis for models that will in the future be able to predict treatment outcomes. And although there is some work on that, I don't think we're quite there yet. I'd just like to thank you uh, to my dissertation committee. Um, uh, Professor Obler and Dr. Goral and Dr. Edmonds, and, and to Taryn Malcolm for helping me with the preparation of this talk, and of course to my participants, uh, those that I showed you uh, related to the T-model, and also um, the participants that I showed the videos of, uh, and their families who were really, really, uh, really helpful and wonderful during my doctoral work. So thank you very much. I would be very happy to take questions. And thank you. I would like to hear your thoughts on the model. Um, if you think it might be useful to you in the clinic or in your research or any other thoughts, but of course, any questions. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Lerman, for that um, very interesting talk and very detailed breakdown of the model with uh, clinical examples. So we did have, we're running a little bit over time and we did have a couple of questions in the chat. So I'm wondering if we could um, maybe just address those. Uh, so the first one comes from Laura N, and she wants to know if you would consider treating someone with aphasia by exposing them to a language with similar properties to the one they are experiencing more difficulty with. So she gives an example if the patient um, is a bilingual Spanish English speaker and they have mild aphasia in English, but more moderate to severe aphasia in Spanish would you consider presenting stimuli in another romance language? So I'm guessing like a very con big constraint, almost like teaching a new language. I'm not sure why you would want to do that if they already have difficulty in those languages. 
Um, there has, I have heard of, of people who have been looking into teaching a new language to someone with aphasia. I haven't actually read any results on that. Uh, I know that I, I had a couple of colleagues who were thinking of running a study like that, but I haven't seen the results and I'm not sure they even ran it. Um, I'm not sure that that would help but with, um, within our cross-language generalization. We're thinking about skills that are already there and we just can't access them. But we know that the lexicon is there. We know that the, the language skills are there. We're just trying to rebuild that access, rebuild those networks. And so to bring in another language, I'm not sure that that would be uh, helpful. I think it would be very difficult to do that. Um, we have to think about which language or which languages are important to the person. So which languages they need for communication, but also which languages they need for, for themselves to feel uh, whole. If, they're per, if they think of themselves as a bilingual English and Hebrew speaker, even if they don't need to use their Hebrew anymore, it may be that they want to retain their Hebrew just to feel whole, to feel as they were. Okay, and that was actually the case where I just spent the videos of that he didn't have any need for his Hebrew, but he really wanted to keep up um, just to feel a whole person again. And so we have to take that into account uh, in terms of the preferences of the person and what the person needs for himself. And if somebody came to me and said, well, I really want to learn a new language because of this, this I wouldn't necessarily say you can't do it, but I'm not, I haven't seen any research that it's actually, um, helpful for the languages they have or that it's even possible. All right, thank you for that response, Dr. Lerman. We have another uh, question from Dr. Hia Dada um, with some positive comments for your presentation. And then she went on to say she had attended a talk on bilingual agrammatism on Monday and the investigator um, commented that the amount of language generated for a story narrative, for example, something like Frog, Where Are You? versus a picture description task in the WAB. And she wonders if you had any thoughts for a bilingual individual, given that there are different narrative styles that vary between languages and dialects, any other, or if there are any other factors that might influence the nature of the language generated from each of these tasks. That's a really interesting question, right? Just uh, different. It is a really dialect. interesting question. I was in the same talk as uh, Dr. Dada, so uh, I know what she's talking about. Yes. The WAB only has picture descriptions, but when I was talking about within language uh, generalization and cross language generalization of my participants, and I, I spoke about their narrative skills, that covered um, picture descriptions, story sequencing, um, procedural narratives, and personal narratives. So we did have a much uh, larger genre of um, narrative skills. I'm still working on that data in terms of differences between those, those um, different uh, genres of narratives. Um, I didn't say huge difference, but it does, it does depend on how you pose data in one For example, one of the main is, uh, um, uh, it's called uh, C is complete utterances. So how many relevant SVO sentences did the participant uh, produce during narrative uh, stories? And that's a great uh, way to count personal narratives and story sequences and even picture descriptions, but it doesn't work well with procedural narratives because people don't usually use complete SVO sentences when they're saying, uh, I'm making an omelet. I take the egg, then uh, then break it, then cook it, then, 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 okay. And you don't always get these uh, full sentences, but the, the narrative still makes perfect sense. So in terms of coding the data, we have to think about that. In terms of cultural differences for storytelling, um, it's, it's an interesting question. I didn't find that there was, um, in the participants that I looked at, I didn't find that that was a problem um, because they were, first of all, they were both um, from North America, uh, all three of them actually from North America um, in the first place. So they all had the same cultural background and then Israel uh, was already, Hebrew was her second language. So I didn't really have that. There's some stories that would be less appropriate for maybe, um, native Hebrew speakers from certain cultures in Israel. Um, certainly something that I think about when, when I'm giving uh, patients and participants um, stories to tell. Um, but in terms of genres, in terms of the actual storytelling skills, I haven't seen a big difference within the languages that I've researched. 
Okay, thank you for that, um, Dr. Lerman and Dr. Dada. So just one more question before we move on from Jacqueline A. And she wants to know about one of the clients, although she might have to clarify which one, um, the client was tested on different days. Could that be a factor in the assessment? And would testing both languages on the same day provide different results? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. That all of my participants were tested on both their languages in a, a she says the very first line, all, all three were tested in um, over one week, they were tested in both their languages, a huge uh, language and stuff. And so we um, tested, we were very careful that we had different testers. So we had one thing in the environment. Oh no. One person testing English the entire time, and they didn't mix language. Dr. Lerman, your your audio is cutting out a little bit, um, and I yeah. think we should move on. Um, just in the interest of time, would you mind just popping some of that response into the chat? Oh, I think we lost her. Oh no! She told me if that happens, that she will pop right back on. Okay, good. All right. Well, I think then we will go ahead and move on. And, and thank you, uh, Taryn. Our next speaker is Taryn Malcolm, who is a practicing speech language pathologist in New York. And she is a doctoral candidate at the I CUNY Center. Yeah, this is part of the stress. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, Taryn Malcolm is an SLP and a doctoral candidate at the CUNY Graduate Center. She is working under Dr. Lorraine Obler. She has worked in both acute and subacute rehabilitation for over 10 years, and she has experience in pediatrics and adults. Her research interests include bilingualism, bilingual aphasia, brain and language, and healthy aging partnerships between the university and the local community to bridge research to practice gaps. Very exciting. Um, we are excited to hear from Taryn Malcolm today. So you can go ahead and uh, put your slides up. You're on, you're on mute. Thank you. I thought I clicked it, but okay. I didn't go through. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you, Melissa, um, for that introduction. Um, so uh, my talk today is similar to Dr. Lerman's with a little bit of a different viewpoint. Um, so today I wanted to talk about implications of bilingualism and bidialectalism in aphasia. And so um, when we talk about bilingualism and bidialectalism, particularly in aphasia, uh, as Dr. Lerman had mentioned previously, we want to really examine how languages or varieties of languages that we would call dialects can manifest in individuals with aphasia. And we want to discuss the differences first between what we call a dialect and what we call a language. Um, so I know Dr. Lerman had mentioned different dialects of Arabic um, and how those are closely related but slightly different. Um, and how my view and my research looks at two uh, varieties that some may call dialects, but others call languages, and I would call them a language. Um, and so because they're so closely related, how does that affect uh, healthy speakers and how that would then help uh, or impact people who had aphasia? So we want to specifically look today at Jamaican Creole and Standard English and discuss how understanding these differences between these two languages can impact how we assess and treat aphasia in individuals with two languages that are so closely related, um, for example, in this uh, bilingual language pair. So before we get started on aphasia, 
I just wanted to briefly go through uh, the differences between a language and a dialect. Um, so most people would agree that a language really is a communication system that has rules and is structured. And speakers of that language uh, share this set of rules and we agree that um, these are the rules of the language and we follow them. Um, but when we talk about a dialect, there's a little bit more of a gray area there. So a dialect can be described in one of two ways. So the first way and the way that I would describe a dialect would be a variety of language. So this is a, a variety that is characteristic of a certain group of speakers. Um, and these two varieties are mutually intelligible. So for example, Dr. Lerman very clearly stated that she speaks British English and I of course do not, I speak American English, but our English is our dialects, our varieties of English are mutually intelligible. We can understand each other. There may be some lexical differences and certainly some phonological differences, but for the most part, these two varieties um, are intelligible, uh, especially when close to each other on a dialect continuum. Um, but there's another way that people use the term dialect, and this one has a little bit more of a negative um, viewpoint, um, people sometimes call uh, a, a, a linguistic system a dialect based uh, in, in with this sort of pejorative undertone. Um, so it is more referring to a, a communication system that may have a perceived subordinate um, status, maybe not viewed as highly as let's say a standard language uh, like standard English. Um, and so this term dialect uh, doesn't really reflect the aspects of that communication system, but rather a uh, perception of it. Um, and so there really is this question then, so at what point, um, if we're using sort of the viewpoint that uh, a dialect is a variety and is mutually intelligible um, and two languages then are separate, at what point along that continuum does uh, is a variety of a language, meaning a dialect, different enough that it can be considered a language. And so um, just to give you some background when we're discussing Jamaican Creole. So again, when I'm referring to dialect, I'm referring to a variety of a language rather than sort of this negative viewpoint um, and has sort of a social dialect. So we can all say that we all speak a language and a dialect at the same time. Um, most people here would speak a New York dialect um, unless you're from somewhere else. Um, and that's very different from a Creole, which is what we're going to be discussing. So before we talk about Creoles, I just wanted to introduce the term pidgin for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, a pidgin is a linguistic system that develops um, where two different groups of speakers uh, or two different groups speak different languages. And in order to communicate with each other, they develop a, a system that is not native to either group. And then from that, uh, a Creole then um, is created by the next generation. And that language that uh, was used for those two groups to communicate uh, becomes native to the next generation and the next generation. And Creoles typically um, have been sort of uh, born from this contact between a, a colonizing group and colonized people. So because of colonialism, we see several of these types of Creoles around the Caribbean, around Asia, um, uh, around Africa. So depending on where colonialism went, you could see these types, uh, you can see types of Creoles uh, being generated. Um, but my particular talk today is about Jamaican Creole. And I, um, just to refresh some of you, Jamaica, um, is the largest English speaking um, Caribbean country in the Caribbean. It's in the Greater Antilles, um, which is, if you look at the very top of this figure, you'll see Florida up here. 90 miles south of Florida is Cuba, this very large island right here. And 90 miles south of Cuba is Jamaica in this red circle. And so in Jamaica, the standard and official language of the country is standard English because up until the 1960s, uh, Jamaica was a British colony. Um, before that, it had been um, a Spanish colony and then the British took over. So you will see some influence from Spanish, but primarily a lot of the influence is from uh, British uh, language, so English. <clears throat> 
Um, but also in Jamaica, many people speak what I would call Jamaican Creole, but is locally referred to as either Patois or some people just call it Jamaican. Um, and in a 2005 survey, the linguistics department, um, which is called the Jamaican Language Unit at the University of West Indies, Mona, um, took a survey and found that 78.6% of the people polled stated that they were bilingual speakers of Jamaican and English. And so Jamaican Creole then, so what is it and what does that mean? Um, it's an English Creole that developed when West African slaves were brought to Jamaica by the British. And so these people who spoke West African languages because they weren't always the same West African language um, had to communicate with people who spoke English. Um, and a, a language, a common language was developed that really consisted of the syntax and the morphology, so the structure of these West African languages, um, but had lexifiers, so um, uh, lexical items that sounded like or were similar to that colonial language, which was English. And because uh, Jamaican Creole um, is lexified by English, Jamaican Creole can at times sound somewhat like English, but has a very different morphosyntactic structure than that of standard English. And so just to highlight some of these morphosyntactic uh, features that differ, um, these are, this is not a, a complete list, but rather the three areas of morphosyntax that I'm focusing on in my work. Um, so three uh, examples would be copula use. So for example, in English, you would say, I am happy. Um, and in Jamaican Creole, you would say, me happy. Um, in, for verb tense marking, uh, in Jamaican Creole, uh, there's a pre-verbal uh, marker. So instead of saying he washed his hands, you would say him did wash him hands. Um, and in, for subject verb inflection, um, instead of saying he tells me everything, you would say him tell me everything. So you can see here this copula structure is a zero marked structure and this subject verb agreement again is a zero mark structure because they don't exist in Jamaican Creole. And for verb tense marking, we have this pre-verbal marker to indicate tense. And so um, many linguists like to discuss or describe um, Jamaican Creole as existing on a linguistic continuum, um, where uh, at one end you have what we refer to as the basilect, which would be uh, closely related to the Creole that was developed um, in the early years uh, after that pigeon uh, was born. Um, and then at the other end of this spectrum we have, or this continuum, we have the acrylect, which has uh, more closely reflects structures that are related to English. And then you have all of this area in between, which we sort of refer to as the mesolect. Um, and so when in the literature, the, this continuum is uh, sort of referred to how, how these Jamaican Creole speakers produce Jamaican Creole. Um, but we hypothesize in, in my doctoral dissertation that this really isn't just um, a continuum of what Jamaican Creole is, but rather this really is a reflection of a dynamic bilingual individual and their language abilities when they have either more or less proficiency in both Jamaican Creole and in standard English. Um, and so what does this really have to do with bilingual aphasia? Well, when we're looking at people with bilingual aphasia, um, as Dr. Lerman said, uh, bilingual aphasia is an impairment in both languages after damage to the language dominant brain hemisphere, usually the left, in a bilingual individual. And these can be changes to both languages following a stroke, um, depending on the location of the damage relative to those language centers in the brain that Dr. Lerman so nicely showed you. And these can manifest differently depending on that location of damage um, and also this heterogeneity within these different language pairs. So just like Dr. Lerman was stating, we have to look at these brain lesions, we have to look at this language background, these multilingualism factors, right? And so some of these factors can include ages of acquisition, variable proficiency across the lifespan, use, um, and there are several others. So uh, 
when we're thinking about aphasia and particularly verbs, because as you could see from those morphosyntactic features that I pointed out, they were all related to the verb phrase structure. So um, what's happening to verbs in aphasia, particularly in a grammatism, which is my uh, area of interest. So some features of a grammatism, uh, a grammatism can be described as omissions and substitutions of functors and affixations. So we've seen this before and we certainly saw this um, uh, in some of the uh, videos uh, that Dr. Lerman showed us. Um, so there'll be omissions of functor words, certainly affixations like verb inflections um, can be omitted or substituted. There will be spared content words resulting in these telegraphic utterances in a grammatism. Syntactic processing uh, is impacted both in comprehension and in production. And uh, people with a grammatism may reduce their speech to its most salient elements to convey meaning. And so for those of us who work with individuals with aphasia, we see this all the time um, where they have to tell you that they want something and they give you the most salient one or two words to convey the greatest meaning, right? Um, and so verbs in a grammatism are particularly affected uh, where uh, verbs will, res uh, in individuals with a grammatism will have a deficit in subject verb agreement, in a lack of copula use, um, a lack of both derivational and inflectional morphology, and verb tense in particular is most vulnerable to language change in a grammatism. So hopefully you can see where I'm going here, that these three areas are, are particularly difficult for individuals with a grammatism. And they just so happen to be three morphosyntactic areas where Jamaican Creole and standard English differ. So then uh, what do you do with someone who has a grammatism who speaks both Jamaican Creole and standard English? And so that was really the purpose of my work um, is to just sort of determine what is normal and normal variation in the morphosyntax of Jamaican Creole standard English bilingual speakers. And I hope at this point you've been convinced that they that these languages are different enough, um, or at least by the end of this talk that you would call them bilingual speakers as well. Um, but can we use this data from normal healthy adults without neurological damage to build a more valid testing instrument or treatment materials for individuals uh, who speak these two languages? And we want to differentiate what is a consequence of aphasia or a grammatism and what really is the result of language background or that cross-linguistic influence along that continuum that I was talking about between Jamaican Creole and Standard English. And so you can see that Dr. Lerman and I clearly have similar interests um, in our assessments and really trying to, to tease apart these different variables for a more accurate differential diagnosis, right? We really wanna separate a language difference from a language disorder. And we talk about this all the time um, in our graduate programs. So for looking at healthy bilingual speakers to understand this normal variation, uh, in uh, healthy adult speakers, uh, I've generated uh, two research questions. First, uh, can cross-linguistic influence be observed in the morphosyntax of Jamaican Creole standard English bilingual speakers? And if so, how? And second, uh, which sociolinguistic factors uh, contribute to the linguistic influence the two languages have on one another? So for my methods, um, we uh, investigated healthy adult Jamaican Creole English bilingual speakers um, with the intention of later testing individuals with aphasia. Uh, these participants were aged 30 to 70 years old and they were all mesolectal speakers of Jamaican Creole. So if you recall along this continuum, I was particularly interested in people in the middle, right? Our regular everyday people right in the middle of that linguistic continuum. Um, and we wanted to compare this cross-linguistic influence. So how Jamaican Creole and Standard English uh, impact each other in language production um, between a group that we called the immigrant group living in the United States and what we called the non-immigrant group, a group of individuals that we tested who were in Jamaica. Um, and then we wanted to compare these language outcomes with those sociolinguistic factors that I'll mention in a moment. Um, so our criteria for participation were um, healthy adults, 
with no history of neurological damage because we really wanted to find out this normal variation at first. Um, they must have completed up to the 10th grade in Jamaica um, and could not have completed a bachelor's degree. So we really wanted to limit their uh, extra exposure to English. Um, and their place of residence for the group in, the, in Jamaica, the non-immigrant group, they could not have lived outside of Jamaica for more than three months. And for the group in the United States, they could not have lived outside Jamaica or the United States for more than three months. Um, and so we broke down our methods into three parts. So we have um, a set of language questionnaires that we um, combined some modified versions of the language experience and proficiency questionnaire or the LEAPQ um, with another questionnaire called the language use and mixing questionnaire. And so we modified and combined these two questionnaires to um, get some information from the participants uh, related to frequency and context of language use. So how often and in what context you're using each language the attitudes towards their two languages. Um, so like I said, some uh, languages may be referred to as dialects and may have this negative perception. So we wanted to gauge what the perception of each language was for that individual. Um, we had some motivation questions that we actually developed um, that asked uh, how motivated they were to use each language. And then we asked them to self-rate their language proficiency and report, have a self-reported effort. So how easy or difficult they felt each language was. Uh, for the next uh, task, we had all of the participants complete an oral repetition of sentences. So these sentences included both past and future tense verbs. And we had a set in Jamaican Creole and a set in English. And I'll just provide you an example of one of the Jamaican Creole sentences that they had to repeat exactly. Oops, I'm sorry. There we go. So that was one of our future tense sentences, Shiagotaipaleta. Um, and then next we uh, did a short narrative, or uh, we had the participants complete a short narrative in both, or two short narratives actually, in the past and future tenses, uh, both in Jamaican Creole and in Standard English. So again, I'm going to provide you an example, but this example is the response from one of our participants, uh, just to sort of give you an idea of what the, the responses were. Um, for our prompt for the short narrative, uh, we again tried to uh, generate a prompt that was culturally appropriate. So the prompt for the past tense that, uh, narrative that you're going to hear right now is, tell me a time that you remember about a storm. Um, because Jamaica is obviously in the Caribbean and uh, storms happen frequently. Actually, all of our participants told us about the same storm. So here's an example right now. Well, I remember Hurricane Gilbert as I look at you to come up. We never really have food in the house and them things. We never have money for buy food and them things. So Hurricane Gilbert was like a blessing and a curse at the same time. So you can see in that narrative, um, we're getting, we have three verbs that were produced. So first, that participant said, I remember uh, a Hurricane Gilbert, which was the hurricane that everyone talked about, um, which is a zero marked verb marking. He then says, I never have, which is a negative pre-verbal Jamaican Creole marker uh, for a verb. And then he said, uh, it was, right? Which is an English verb form. So we actually, this particular narrative was a Jamaican Creole narrative. We asked him to produce this narrative in Jamaican Creole. Um, and so within that first uh, you know, 20 seconds, he produced three different uh, verb markings. So you can see this type of language mixing in this normal variation. And so what did we find based on our results? I'm just gonna um, show you some of my results today. Um, but again, just to remind you, we were looking at those verb tense markings, both in past and future, the subject verb agreement, which uh, exists in, in English, but not in Jamaican Creole, and copula use, which again is zero marked in Jamaican Creole, but obviously we have copulas in English. And so first I wanted to show you the percent of correct verb marking in Jamaican Creole. Um, I'm saying correct, and by correct I mean, are they producing the target verb that we were asking them to produce. So we're not implying that 
you know, speaking the other language is incorrect. But if I asked you to speak in English, did you produce an English marked verb? If I asked you to speak in Jamaican Creole, did you speak a Jamaican Creole marked verb? Um, and so for this second set of bars, if you look uh, at this, uh, these two in the uh, second set, uh, these are Jamaican Creole past tense verbs within that narrative task that it, you just listened to. And so we found a significant difference, a statistically significant difference between the two groups, the red group being the group in the United States and orange being the group in Jamaica. And so here what we're seeing is that when asked to speak Jamaican Creole and produce a Jamaican Creole marked verb, um, the people uh, that we tested in Jamaica are almost at ceiling. Um, with some variation. So I won't say that everybody produced this 100%. You can certainly see that both groups never made it to 100%. Um, but our group in the United States who immigrated and now were immersed in their L2 environment are only producing JC past tense verbs uh, that we were requesting about 50% of the time. Um, and, about, and for the other 50% that they were not, producing these, um, the pre-verbal markers that we were uh, asking them to produce, uh, they produce either zero marked forms, so zero marked verb forms without any inflection and without any pre-verbal marker, or they produced an English irregular marked verb. Um, so we're seeing this language mixing more in the group in the United States, but only in this particular task. For the group, for the next set of verbs that we looked at, we looked at standard English. So remember, we tested in both languages. And again, we found a statistically significant difference between the group in uh, the US and the group in Jamaica. Um, so again, so now this is an English repetition task. So they had to repeat the sentences exactly as they were said in English. For example, I washed my hands. So that was one of the sentences. So um, uh, they had to produce these forms exactly. Um, and if they didn't mark the verb how we marked them in the sentence, uh, it was uh, marked as an error. And then we looked to see um, how they were then marking those verbs. So the group in the United States produced the target verb uh, about 60% of the time. I'm still not anywhere near ceiling. So there was some variability in that group in the United States. And the group in Jamaica uh, produced the target verb in the past tense uh, English about 27% of the time. Um, and so again, uh, so then we move to subject verb agreement and narratives. Again, as I said, there's no subject verb agreement in Jamaican Creole. And we saw that about almost 60% of the time, the group in the United States was mixing elements of subject verb agreement into their Jamaican Creole narratives. Um, and additionally, this group in Jamaica is producing, is doing the same thing, mixing those English forms into a Jamaican Creole narrative, although to a much lesser degree. Um, I didn't comment on copula use because we didn't find any statistically significant findings for copula use, uh, but if you had questions about that, I can certainly answer them later. But just to summarize, um, in that Jamaican Creole past tense short narrative, the group in the United States had fewer Jamaican Creole marked verbs in a Jamaican Creole narrative. Um, for that standard English past tense repetition task, the group in the United States had more correct English verbs, correctly marked English verbs than the group in Jamaica. Um, for subject verb agreement in a Jamaican Creole narrative, the group in the United States mixed subject verb agreement, which is an English form, more um, into the narrative than the group of individuals in Jamaica. And again, like I said, Copula use, uh, we didn't find any sig uh, statistically significant findings, which was likely due to a lack of power. Um, but we did have notably more copula use from that group in the United States uh, than the group in Jamaica, but not to uh, a degree that was statistically significant. Um, we then wanted to look at what factors impacted language. So we asked questions about language use, and these are some just some examples. Um, so about frequency of use, we asked what percent of the day do you speak Jamaican Creole? Um, and for context, what language do you speak to your spouse? Um, we had about 12 of these questions. 
For an example of an attitude question, rate from a scale of one to six, I enjoy speaking English at work. Uh, for motivation, one example would be I speak Jamaican Creole because it's part of my cultural identity and they had to rate that. They either agreed or disagreed. Um, they then had to rate their uh, proficiency. So what is your proficiency when speaking Jamaican Creole? Um, and finally, a self-reported effort. So again, they had to rate themselves. Uh, so I find speaking English difficult. Um, and so for the sociolinguistic factors, what we found uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the comparisons. So between the, the first is the language task and second is that sociolinguistic factor. So for Jamaican Creole past tense verbs and Jamaican Creole exposure, as daily Jamaican Creole exposure uh, increased, the participant had more accurate Jamaican Creole past tense verb marking in that repetition task. Um, when choosing to speak to someone equally fluent in both Jamaican Creole and English, um, uh, individuals had less mixing of subject verb agreement into those Jamaican Creole narratives. And as daily Jamaican Creole uh, exposure increased, uh, the individuals had less mixing, oh, I'm sorry for the typo there, of some subject verb agreement into Jamaican Creole narratives. For those attitude questions, the more one enjoys speaking Jamaican Creole at home, the more accurate your Jamaican Creole uh, future verb marking in that repetition task, the more valuable one finds speaking Jamaican Creole at home, the more accurate, again, that Jamaican Creole future verb marking, the more valuable one finds speaking English at work, the more accurate English future verb marking, and the more one enjoys speaking English at work, the more accurate one subject verb agreement in an English narrative. And finally, for self-reported effort, um, the less difficult one finds Jamaican Creole, the more accurate your Jamaican Creole verb marking in the repetition task. Uh, the less difficult one finds speaking uh, standard English, the more accurate their past tense verb marking. And the less difficulty speaking English, the more accurate their subject verb agreement in an English narrative. And so what does this really mean? I've talked a lot about Jamaican Creole, um, mostly because I think many people are unfamiliar with it. Um, but what does this mean then to bring it back to a grammatism? So in order to understand how these languages are manifesting um, in a grammatism, we really need to understand how Jamaican Creole and English differ but, uh, in verb tense marking, in subject verb agreement, and in copula use, especially if we're going to use these features as um, as benchmarks for whether or not these individuals have a grammatism. Um, and we want to determine what a grammatism looks like in Jamaican Creole speakers, uh, especially Jamaican Creole English bilingual speakers. And what features are we looking for to diagnose a grammatism? Is there something else we can look at? Um, so actually, uh, some additional measures have just started being uh, just started being published about um, to be reliable when trying to tease apart a grammatism from generally impaired syntax that occurs in other aphasia subtypes. So actually, Dr. Faroqui Shah just presented this at the Academy, Academy of Aphasia a few weeks ago um, and reduced down um, McWinney's work from 2011 to include six features that may be able to distinguish a grammatism uh, from other aphasia subtypes. These include MLU and morphemes, verbs per utterance, density, noun verb ratio, open closed class ratio, and index of productive syntax. And uh, while this research also is in its preliminary stages, what we're hoping is that we can sort of take these measurements and test them across different languages to see if there are two or three or maybe four features that we can test clinically to see, uh, to assess and diagnose a grammatism that aren't so language specific like uh, inflectional morphology, right? And so in conclusion, um, I just wanted to sort of sum up everything we think about when we think about Jamaican Creole English bilinguals. So are, have I convinced you that Jamaican Creole English uh, speakers are bilingual. I hope I have. I've convinced myself, I hope I've convinced all of you, um, that the two languages are different enough to be considered their own languages, and that Jamaican Creole English speakers and other Caribbean English Creole 
English bilinguals should be treated in the clinic like any other bilingual individual. Is there normal variability within this group of bilingual speakers due to their different language backgrounds and language needs? Absolutely, yes. Um, and again, just like Dr. Lerma was talking about, we need to take these multilingualism factors into consideration uh, when we're assessing our clinical populations. And finally, do we need to continue to examine uh, healthy adult bilingual speakers so we can better understand this variability in the languages to apply to our clinical populations? 100% yes, which hopefully will be my future uh, research goals. Um, if you, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, those that have helped me along this way. Um, my dissertation committee, uh, Dr. Lorraine Obler, Dr. Nancy Ang, uh, Dr. Martin Gitterman, the members of Dr. Obler's Neurolinguistics Lab, uh, Dr. Aviva Lerman, who practiced this talk with me, um, and my research assistants, Christina Oros and Lauren Davidson, and of course, my participants for being wonderful and sitting through a very long testing session um, and my references. And thank you so much. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you for that talk. We do have a couple of questions. We have um, starting with two from Dr. Dada. I'm going to start with um, the one that will have more of a brief response and then one that might have a longer one. So um, she wanted to know if there was a cutoff or range of length of residence in the US for the immigrant group. Meaning did I cut, cut off their length of residence when I tested them? No. So there was a range. And so it ranged from five years to 25 years. And we did test length of residence. I didn't include it in this talk because I wanted to keep it to 30 minutes, um, but we did not find any significant um, findings when we correlated length of residence to their language outcomes. So I, that may be because they all immigrated here as adults um, and they completed high school in Jamaica, um, but we didn't find um, any, um, any, any differences with length of residence, no. Okay, thank you. And then the other part of her question, in addition to the positive comments on your talk, um, is it your opinion that dialects, creoles, and pigeons have different linguistic statuses? And what about social status for each of these? Do I think they have different statuses? Yes. I don't, I think it depends on each individual, um, how they view it. So I feel, so for example, I can talk about Jamaican Creole. Um, I think a dialect is just as important as a Creole, which is just as important as a language, as they say, you know, a, a, a language is, a, what's the difference between a Creole and a language? A Navy, right? So um, I would certainly say that there is a perceived difference. I don't think there is a, a as big of a linguistic difference, right? And so in the linguistic literature, I mean, every linguist that you read about who, who writes about Jamaican Creole or any other Creole uh, talks about it like it's a language. Um, and certainly there has been this debate in the literature about um, Creole exceptionalism um, and not to treat, there's this whole back and forth uh, between um, uh, John McWhorter and uh, Michelle de Graff about Creole exception, exceptionalism. Um, but it, when you think about it, uh, uh, about a Creole based on its elements, it's just like speaking another language. So um, when I was practicing this talk with Dr. Lerman and I played the language samples, she would say like, I didn't really understand what they said in Jamaican Creole because you don't speak Jamaican Creole. And if, I, if you played something like when she played that Hebrew narrative for me, I also didn't know what he was saying because I don't speak Hebrew, but I, I personally don't think there's much of a difference linguistically, but I do want to highlight that there are perceived differences, especially among speakers of those languages. And so we asked those questions because Jamaican Creole was developed in sort of the situation of slavery. So you have a perceived uh, sort of superiority in English. So that sometimes still persists. When you sorry. say perceived, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you mean socially perceived differences or linguistically perceived differences? Socially perceived differences. So um, even in Jamaica, the, the government, despite that uh, Jamaican language unit, the linguistics department in Jamaica, 
they have petitioned many times to make Jamaican Creole the, a second official language of Jamaica, and it still has not been recognized, um, even though they got their independence in the 1960s. Um, but that being said, there's also a positive social perception with some people also. So particularly our individuals who immigrated to uh, the United States, um, when we taught, when we asked that question, um, uh, is Jamaican Creole part of my cultural identity? All of the individuals in the United States absolutely rated it very highly. Like, yes, it's part of my cultural identity. And the people in Jamaica were like, meh, neutral, right? Because they don't have to prove their cultural identity. They live in Jamaica. You know that they're Jamaican. But once you've immigrated someplace else, you hang on to like your food and your language and things about your culture. So I do think there are those social aspects there that can impact it. Great, thank you for that response. Um, we have one more question from Dr. Laura Koenig and she says the sociolinguistic factors point to strong roles of interlocutor and setting. Could you comment on these as methodological variables for example, what you think about when designing a study. Do you mean when, uh, uh, just to clarify that question, did um, you mean when we uh, tested their languages or do you mean when we're actually uh, what we're involved with those sociolinguistic factors? Because when we tested the languages, just to clarify, um, like I did not test the Jamaican Creole, right? So all of our um, instructions were provided auditorily. Um, everything in Jamaican Creole was provided by a, a native Jamaican Creole speaker. Um, and uh, everything in English was provided by a different uh, English speaker of the same gender and age. So um, we did try to control for that. Um, but in terms of um, sociolinguistic factors, so those sociolinguistic factors that I was discussing before, that was part of the questionnaire. So we were asking um, those questions, whether or not they actually, um, they report, each, each of the participants reported that they used either this language or they rated how much they used each language in each of those contexts. Um, but it, I agree, it would be interesting to see, maybe if you followed someone to see what they actually speak to their spouse um, or what they actually do in a workplace setting, um, although that would be a very <laughs> difficult study to complete. Um, did that answer your question? Well, so, so it does. So you had, you had multiple interviewers. You, you tried so, to match them. Yes, but, but it was all, so when, we uh, set up the study, so we would give them the headphones, yes. And then we had a different um, uh, person recorded in Jamaican Creole and in English. Yes. Okay. Um, I, I'm just thinking of some of the, the, the sort of classic Lebovian strategies that people use to try and get to a person's typical language and bringing in family members and that kind of thing. But it just, what, what, what's interesting about this to me is that it, it opens up, it, 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 it throws variation into your study too. And in a sense, you need that to get, to get at what you're looking for. Right. But it kind of cuts both ways, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so it's, it's interesting when you talk about well, sort of like methodology and um, uh, so how they sort of responded, um, especially with those sociolinguistic factors. So as I was saying before, a lot of my participants in the United States, you know, Jermaine Creel is very much part of their identity. And we actually, when we looked at the proficiency measures, everyone in the United States rated themselves as a five or a six. So they rated their proficiency in Jamaican Creole very high. Um, and the people in Jamaica were kind of, again, in the middle, um, but the, their actual uh, language test didn't match up with how they self-rated their proficiency. And I do think that has to do, again, with this perceived cultural identity. Like, yes, of course I speak, um, Jamaican Creole, but um, when you asked me to tell this narrative in Jamaican Creole, I'm not sure I could speak a whole paragraph, right? So um, um, that there was some 
sort of discrepancy there, but uh, we're able to look at, at actually how they did on the task and how they rated themselves. So, um, which is why we asked so many questions about their use and motivation. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So that um, brings us to the end of our questions in the chat. We can open up to general discussion or further questions. If anybody has any, you can um, try to use the raise hand feature or just vigorously wave at us and I will scroll through all the videos looking for you. Um, if anyone has anything else to say. Um, we also can go over to reactions and pop up some applause emojis for both of our speakers who were fantastic, engaging, and informative today. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Dada has another question. Please unmute and uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm asking so many questions, but the talks were so interesting. I can't stop myself. So um, I, had, I have a, um, not a research question, but um, sort of an application question to both of you. So I think both of you presented some really interesting data as well as a big picture, you know, sort of things to think about. How do you propose, given this is all a work in progress, that we bring some of this work to the clinicians as well as to our classrooms? Uh, and particularly, I'm going to teach acquired neurogenic disorders next semester. So any, any advice would be most welcome. Thank you. Do you want to go first, Aviva, or do you want me to answer? I can go first. <laughs> so um, what I think is really important with bilingual or multilingual populations, especially clinically, um, is that you really need to, and, and this speaks a lot to what Dr. Lerner was talking about, um, understand not only there's those stroke factors and you know assessment or treatment factors, but really those multilingualism factors. And I think, um, especially in our clinical assessments um, outside the bilingual aphasia test, which has a very long, as you know, um, language questionnaire or language background in the beginning, very few of these assessments really sort of tap into uh, how individuals were using their languages before. Many of them are not obviously valid on bilingual individuals uh, with the exception of maybe the bilingual aphasia test or if you tested each language in a standardized test in that way. Um, so I think it's really important to not only ask questions about um, where their stroke was, you know, can they name these items? What are their narratives like? But what they were doing pre-stroke, right? So maybe you live in the United States and at work you speak English, but at home you primarily speak Italian, right? Or a dialect of Italian that is not, I'm saying Italian because this is who I see in my clinical practice. Um, I work in an Italian and Greek neighborhood and we get many individuals who are especially older individuals, maybe they have aphasia and um, they'll speak a dialect of Italian that their grandchildren don't even speak. So then, you know, we have these these questions that we really need to ask, what are they speaking at home? Who are they speaking to? Um, and I think this speaks to, to Dr. Lerman's answer about that question earlier, what language do you treat in? Well, what's important to that client, right? And their family. Um, so I think the example I tend to use is I had this trilingual individual who her first language was Spanish. She, as a young adult, moved to Switzerland to boarding school. She was from Cuba. Um, so, and then couldn't go back to Cuba. Um, so then knew German, um, uh, spoke Spanish, spoke German, then moved to the United States and spoke English and spoke all three languages to a high level of proficiency throughout her life. Then had a stroke. And when it came to testing and so assessing and treating her, uh, I spent almost an entire session talking to her family to find out, is it important to test each of these languages? Is it important to treat these languages? Is this something she wants? And she said she wanted to work in all three languages. So you really have to think about this and um, think about how that's going to impact your scores on your testing batteries, how that's going to impact how you, how you structure your treatment. Like uh, Dr. Lerman said, maybe, um, a different language each day, or in my case, um, with this particular patient, we had to do a different language each week because the inhibition was so strong. 
Um, so you just had to be, you have to be open and flexible to that particular individual's background. Yeah, I just, I wanna to add to that, um, both a clinical point and then also in terms of teaching. So clinically, I think that we have to also, I, the way that I presented my data is really ideal. It's actually very difficult to get a, a full language background from somebody with aphasia. And if you don't have the support of their family, and it's not even just about support, sometimes their families, like there's the spouse, didn't know them when they were acquiring this language or that language. and they can't tell you about that background uh, from their early childhood or even later childhood. And so sometimes it can be very difficult to really understand that background and what's going on. So yes, it's an ideal that we have that information. No, we don't always have it as we would want to have it, but certainly it's something we should be trying to, to get. Um, I'm also a big advocate in uh, using narratives to compare across languages when you don't have uh, a language test in the language that, that you want, or if you have the bilingual aphasia test, but it's not appropriate for their level of uh, aphasia. It's, uh, they have severe or mild aphasia, the, the bilingual aphasia test isn't always great. So having the two language samples uh, of them telling the same story or a similar story is often a great way to just sort of push off to understand the balance between the languages post-stroke. Um, and in terms of teaching, I think that it is really important um, to raise these points in a classroom where your student, for example, I teach in a master's program where in Israel, the master students are already qualified SLPs. And so they come with clinical experience and they come from different backgrounds. So I have different language pairs. I have students that um, have Hebrew, Russian, and students that have Arabic and Hebrew, and students that are speaking Yiddish and Hebrew in their clinical work. Um, and so when you raise certain, like the theoretical points, but ask them to bring the examples from their clinical work, it opens up a whole new world of ideas, languages that I do not speak and I don't know, but they bring their examples and we discuss it and it gives everyone a more um, well-rounded understanding of, of what we're talking about in terms of bilingual aphasia and not just, oh, the, the lecturer only speaks English and Hebrew, so we're gonna yeah. stick to those languages for all our examples. I don't think that's a good way. So bringing, people always, as soon as you start talking about bilinguals in the classroom, everyone has a story because everyone, is or knows someone who is bilingual and certainly in clinical settings as well, whether it's with adults or children. So yeah, usually you can get a lot of information from, from students, which then sort of comes back again and then you bring it back to the theory. And, and, and so once you start asking the questions and thinking and thinking about it, suddenly everyone is, oh, wait, but oh, hold on. But I just, and it's really, um, it's great. Yeah, that's that's great, actually. But it's very challenging, though, that model in a classroom where that diversity is not there. And I teach in classrooms. Um, well, I've taught for over eight years and, you know, my student body are largely monolingual, if not monodialectal. And so what I want to take away from this is what they need to know given that they will not probably do bilingual treatment, but, but what can they know so that they can um, still gain trust of the patient and treat them adequately if the patient never sees a bilingual clinician in his or her life? But I mean, absolutely everything you've said. You know which questions to ask and when to find help in terms of a translator or- Or a cultural uh, yeah. yeah, I mean- yeah. Dr. Dada, I can speak as a monolingual, monodialectal speech language pathologist in New York. <laughs> I have treated, you know, if you think living in New York, you are going to treat only monolingual lingual English speakers, you are sadly mistaken. I have had almost every language pair that you could think of. Um, and I think really teaching those problem solving skills, right, of getting a cultural broker, getting a linguistic broker, not having assumptions, I think is one of the most important things, um, uh, culturally and linguistically, right? Like, you know, I, not looking at someone say like, oh, you look like you must speak something. First of all, never say that, um, uh, related to language or not, right? So asking very open-ended questions and just teaching them how to navigate, um, what being bilingual means and how that might impact their English or their other language. So 
I mean, I certainly think it is challenging. And I, and I do think there is a difference because in New York, these, a lot of these students, I don't know what semester adult neurogenics is, but usually when I've taught classes, they're usually in their second semester. So they've had limited exposure to um, people with aphasia or they've just had an, or they've just gotten an aphasia client in the clinic. So we've done, um, a sort of, uh, we called it a lab, but the individuals in the class who had the aphasia clients in aphasia group, uh, we had them present and we would do discussions based on those clients, three of which who are bilingual aphasia patients. So then we would talk about how their language um, and how, their, uh, how they perform differently in the group compared to um, our, their monolingual peers. Yeah, and awareness is half the battle. I mean, it may sound hilarious to the group of people here, but I have seen a report um, from a doctor in the hospital where I work, where he said, we needed to see this patient. He has global aphasia and the patient was a French speaker with no aphasia. That happened to me. And they tested him in Hebrew and gave him a diagnosis of global aphasia. So sometimes awareness is half the right. battle. And I think teaching them how to access cultural brokers or linguistic brokers is important because I had a similar situation where the neuropsychologist tested my Urdu speaking patient and they had them do a verbal fluency task and they had them I don't remember what letter they used, but they had them name a bunch of things that started with the letter F and the person did not speak English. <laughs> so understandably they did poorly. And so when we came to team rounds, I was like, he's mildly impaired. I tested him in his native language. And, you know, and the neuropsychologist found him to be severely impaired. So I think being aware and I think knowing how to get the resources is really important too. Great, thank you. Um, any other comments or uh, shall we adjourn the meeting? Uh, McLaughy. Yeah, uh, it's, it's just something very interesting. So thank you very much for uh, this interesting talks. Uh, I kind of probably have kind of a slightly different view of multilingualism, uh, which is for me, it's not different languages or dialects, but it's actually one language. So if you speak uh, Creole, if you speak, um, uh, let's say standard English, to me, that's one language because you know certain things in one language and not in the other. So for me, you're a complete person when you speak the different languages. Um, that's just me, but I, I think it's, it's important to uh, kind of think of it in that way. I'm, I'm thinking of it, let's say, in terms of little children, when they're acquiring languages, I don't just think about the, lang the words that they know, let's say in one language or the other, but I look at what they know in both languages. So to me, it's like one language, right? Because they'll know some items in the other language, but that's not the point anyway. Uh, very interesting talks that you had. Um, uh, it's the aspect of, especially for Terin, you were talking about in your, in your data, you showed that the, they, were not, they couldn't do repetition. What was, what was actually happening? Like, this is very strange. So for instance, if I were to repeat something in Shona that probably all of you cannot speak, you should ideally be able to uh, produce it because it's I speak, you hear auditory and then you program and you speak out. So what is actually happening there when they cannot repeat what you're asking them to repeat? That's a really interesting question. So this is what I've been looking at for the past several weeks in my data. Um, what's been happening really is that, um, so as I said, those sentences were very simple sentences. So uh, we tried to keep them short so we didn't you know, have any sort of memory effects. Um, but the sentences, for example, would be like, I washed my hands. And so typically, almost in both groups, when the target uh, marking was not achieved, I would say it, it depended group to group, but most of the time they produced a zero marked form, which is an acceptable Jamaican Creole form. So they would say, I wash my hands, right? And so again, you're getting, so just like someone with aphasia, right? You've heard, you heard what they said, you're repeating. It's understandable, but it's not marked exactly the same way. And so we tried to figure out if this really was sort of because of morphological deficits, maybe they didn't fully achieve proficiency in English. Um, but again, these people have graduated high school in Jamaica and if you don't know about Jamaican high school, 
Jamaican high school's language of instruction is British English. It follows a British system. So, um, and your final exam is all, you know, written in English. So they should be able to produce these forms. And I actually, when creating this task, actually only created the repetition task with, because I had the intention of taking these same tasks and then later testing people with agrammatism. So I thought all of the healthy adults would perform at ceiling on the repetition task. And as you could see, that was not the case. So um, we do think part of it is morphological, but also phonological. So in um, Jamaican Creole, final cons consonants that end in t or d are dropped about 75% of the time based on Peter Patrick's data um, and Bill above found the same thing. Um, so we're, it's hard to tease apart if it's morphological or phonological. We certainly know that they can hear the forms and produce the forms because each sentence was repeated three times throughout this whole set. Um, and individuals would maybe like produce it correctly once, but zero marked twice um, or produce it correctly twice and zero marked once. And so we've been going through to try to find out why that was. Um, but at what seems like an easy task really revealed how much variability there was in their ability to produce these uh, inflectional morphemes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. I'm bringing this up because I was adapting the bilingual aphasia test and I did the same uh, test uh, in Shona and in English uh, with uh, the people that I was, you know, the participants. And I noticed this and I couldn't explain it because if I say I ate yesterday, how difficult is it to say I ate yesterday? So I, I, I was just trying to figure out maybe if you had other, maybe there's something social going on. I, I don't know, because why would you change a marker? I ate yesterday and then you say I ate and then you don't repeat the other word. What's going on there? But it's, it's, it's very interesting what you say. Yeah, so it was only, so with our sentences, they were only regular verbs because we wanted to force that inflection. Um, and they weren't messing up the whole sentence. They were only um, dropping that inflection morpheme or in the Jamaican Creole sentences, they would either drop all or part of that pre-verbal marker. So I think it's almost like sort of like taking the path of least resistance, right? I'm going the easiest way to convey this information um, because I'm, maybe they haven't fully achieved that marker. Maybe it's too difficult for them to produce. I don't know. Um, and that's what we're still trying to figure out. That was a great discussion. Um, really interesting. Thank you everyone for your contributions. Uh, so we will go ahead and log off now. You all can check um, in a couple days, our YouTube channel will have portions of this talk available. Um, and please uh, contact us if you are interested in a talk or interested in a topic, we um, will be in touch and uh, see you all in the new year. Happy holidays, happy new year and see everyone in 2021. Thank you.